Good morning, everybody. Yes, I am your economic therapist. But I have a reason for being here. Thanks to Leanne and other people, I've had a tremendous set of experiences in Alberta over the last 15, 18 years. Back in 2000, my group did the economic strategy for Greater Edmonton. And after that, we did the first cluster-based economic strategy for Calgary. And we also done work with the provinces. But I am a big fan of Canada. I think you're really a special place. I work in 30 countries. You are a special, special place. I want to make that clear because I really wish sometimes I wasn't Canadian, especially under the current political environment. <laughs> so let me tell you a story about how to make your economies work. There's certain principles that if you get comfortable with them, you can make your economy work fabulously. I'm going to talk about two things. First, I'm going to talk about the framework for a next generation economy. Then I'm going to talk about the way of doing it. I'm going to do it fast. You can get a copy of this at some point in the future if you're interested, or talk to me. I'm pretty good at that. So, how many people feel that economics is mysterious and hard to understand? <coughs> Let's see a show of hands. I just want to know if there's any economic nerds here. Well, I'm not an economist. I am a person who gives economic change and market behavior and how to solve problems. And one of the things we've learned after 40 years of doing this is that you have to distill economics down to something that's really digestible, workable, and practical, and this is what it is. I'm going to talk about four really simple principles that if you understand them and you can practice them, you can actually change your economy in a permanent, continuing way. Here are the principles. Think regionally. Not about jurisdictions, not about political defined entities, but about geography, the community shed. I'll talk about that in a minute. Focus on clusters, we'll talk a lot about that because they're the engines of your economy. Focus on creating input advantages that will grow those clusters, that is key. And learn how to collaborate in ways that are not about special programs or creating nonprofits, but about what markets are at the heart. Markets, I'll talk about this again and again. Markets are about collaboration and exchange. So let's get into the part of the work. Economies do not notice jurisdictions. They don't look about city, they don't look at cities or towns. They look at where they can get a great place to do whatever it is they do. They look at a place they can grow where they have the inputs. And having analyzed this and worked on this for so many years, we found that what really happens is that all around the world, since ancient times, going way back, it's regions defined as a distance people can travel to do something that are where economies take shape. Whatever the reason, there are many reasons. So if you can think regionally, if you have many towns that work together in a regional partnership, it makes you more powerful. It builds up. But here's something that's really, something I've tried to tell administrations, the, the people in the White House, people in administration in, in Ottawa, which is that the, the strength of the, the national economy is the sum of its regions. The GDP that people talk about, there's no national economy. There really isn't. The economy is the sum of the activities that regions do. So that's very important. Now, I can tell you that's a fact because I've worked with so many regions over the years. These are just some US regions, a few, maybe 30 or 40 that we've dealt with, places that you've heard of in the news. Austin, Texas, we were there in 1983 when there was, it was just a, a campus and state capital that had no idea of where it was, what its future was. So we worked with them and got them to really think differently. And we, we've done Silicon Valley and all these other places. I could go on and on. That's just domestically. Just recently, Wichita. Uh, we've also done a lot of work here in Canada. And it's been very exciting. We've had people like the National Research Council and the Western Diversification, all these groups joining with the provinces and with the uh, cities and private sector. But most of the time, this is a kind of an implicit message. The economic initiatives that work are funded not by government, but by syndicates of stakeholders. The word syndicate is a silly term, it just means multiple parties. But the reality is economic change is not about a plan, it's about a movement, it's about changing how economies work. So the lesson here, you might all ask yourselves, this big world, tech firms that we deal with, they, they don't care about your town, they don't care about your city, they care about what they can get. And we have located some major, major corporations in our economy. And they say, does this region have all we need? And it's not about some magic 
you know, industrial attraction strategy. It's about many small solutions. We have a motto that we, we use for years, small solutions, not grand illusions. Well, why is that? It's because many small solutions create a wave of change that is what econ economics is actually about. Economics is always about aggregation. It's the piling up of things, the accumulation, the waves of change. So focus on including everybody because everybody affects the economy, whether it's your school or your grandmother. They all make decisions. Nobody is outside. And economic plans, economic programs, are very narrow. So to have a successful economy, you have to reach out and include lots of other people. And you build up from your assets. I could talk to you all day about that. Not today. But the goal here, the goal is not to have a successful company. It's not about whether or not you have a big star. The goal is what you get from having a successful economy. So what is a successful economy? It has prosperity for its citizens. I'll talk more about that later. It has fairness or sustainable equity or lower uh, disparity. It has quality of life. That's the outcome. When you wake up in the morning, you want to say, yes, our region is actually more prosperous, more sustainable, more fair, giving quality of life. Now, here's the real question, and this is where our work is focused for literally 40 years now, the notion of the industry cluster. What is it? How many people know what a cluster is? I want, I'd love to see a show. Okay, that's good. Well, I think a lot of people don't understand what clusters are. They use the word cluster to describe any lump of things that they want. And perhaps you can say, yeah, that's a cluster. Yeah. Um, the truth is, clusters are very specific. They're economic engines. And they drive those outcomes I was just talking about. They're the engines in your economy for one really simple reason. They bring new money into your metropolitan region or your region, whatever, however you want to define it. Clusters are these engines because they make, produce, ship, whether it's canola or whether it's electronics or whether it's tourism, they bring net new money into your region. And why is that important? It's important because if you don't have the export out of your region, not out of the country, but out of the region, you're going to actually have, believe it or not, a trade deficit. Because you're buying shoes that are made in China, or uh, TV panels that are made in Korea, or you're spending money that goes out of the region, and if you don't have something that you export out, and then, there's so many ways that can be done, it's not the issue, you actually will have a difficulty. So clusters are important because they drive your economy. You want to have a portfolio of those clusters. Every region can have a portfolio of different types of clusters, there's not a rule about what they are. And they will change over time. People forget that. They often say, you know, our oil and gas industry is a solid fundamental basis for our economy. Well, you know, plus, you know, it might be 10 minutes, you know, it might be an hour, you know, but it may not be today. So you want to have different clusters that have different attributes, and you want to extract value and make it grow. And the thing about clusters is that you can have clusters at different stages of the life cycle. So you don't just say, what are our clusters today? You say, okay. What are the established clusters? Well, I'm going to show you the chart. Uh, that's, this is the layer cake of clusters. I'll, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to this for a moment. The thing about clusters is that it's not about companies. It's about economic collaborations, I was saying. So what you have is a layer cake of activities that produce a good or service that goes out of the neighborhood. So you have sole proprietorships. You have uh, uh, international headquarters. You have uh, branch plants. But underneath that, that's where the value starts getting even deeper. You have specialists who devise products or, or services that are needed by the cluster to produce. And the more that you keep in the region, the more value added you, you, you're sharing. And here's where people who do cluster committees, cluster task force, cluster stuff often miss the boat. Real clusters go even deeper down to this bottom foundation layer. They actually have relationships with all these sources of economic inputs, which is going to be the next topic we're going to talk about. Economic inputs are what make clusters form, grow, evolve, and sometimes leave. Because the input advantages, which I'll see in a second, are crucial to the any, any, any activity at all. So this is a little bit technical. If you have a cluster, what is it that you want to accomplish with that cluster? Uh, when you, you know, the ones that people are familiar with, like Hollywood, film, television, radio, music, that's a cluster. Or Las Vegas, you know, when the 
Las Vegas is. <laughs> okay. But the point is, New York Finance, Calgary was your, your energy industry. The thing about clusters is that they have three ways they can make value. One of them is they can cluster and grow around innovation. If there's something that differentiates, their, if they've brought a new solution to the world's problem of some kind, that's one way they can, people come and grow the companies. More companies that will use their technology or want to be there or, or copy them or emulate them or spin off from that. So there's innovation-driven cluster elements. The next part is competition. It's more the productivity side, whether you can actually do the job better. Some parts of the world I work are very productive, other parts are not. I believe I work in a lot of parts of the world. But that's a good story. All right. I'm trying to stay on the time here. The point is that competitive synergy is a key part of certain clusters. You don't have to be more innovative. You just have to use what you have better. And finally, it's that this is the one that I think is actually one that people ignore too much. It's leveraging the value chain. By finding suppliers and people who actually understand how to work with you and having them in your neighborhood, in your region, that creates more value. And that goes back to my point about the key is a cluster is important not just because it, it trades a good surface, but because its value chain is deep or broad. So it's a cluster that's attractive can have, for example, diversity of companies. So you get a lot of jobs through different segments of the same cluster. They don't all do the same thing. They might produce different versions of that product using similar technologies, using similar skills, using similar inputs, but they also can be deep. And they, they can go down. You might have you have clusters that are just sort of assembly, but you're not really good because they don't create a lot of value. They're those that design, engineer, produce, and they go deeper, those are better. So the key is how to build depth and breadth in each cluster. But as a regional economic development stakeholder group, whatever you, you represent, then there's a question of how do you look at yourself over time? Because every economy is dynamic, they're never static. So the key is to understand that every cluster is at a different stage of its life cycle. And when you classify them, it helps you understand what you have to work with, because the problems facing a cluster will be different by that stage. So right here in this chart, you see in the upper right corner, that's the winner's circle that people always talk about, the expanding clusters. Those are groups of companies in a cluster that have higher specialization in your region. There are more of them in your region than is the average in Canada. They also run faster than the average in Canada. So that's this low, they're growing faster, they're more specialized, they're adding jobs, creating value, they're the winners, they're good. But they're not going to stay there forever. They'll have ups and downs. So you need to do more. You need to build up your portfolio. It's very crucial to think portfolio. I'll use that word too much probably. So that brings us to the merging. Sometimes there's a group that you don't have a great specialization in. You have a lot of early stage activities. You have companies, but they're not more specialized than they are in another region. But they're doing one thing that they're not doing in another part of Canada. They're growing faster in your region. But they're not highly specialized. So you want to coach them and help them and support them. They're, they're going to move up. This is the way it is, it's simple. But you also have, on the upper left, these are the ones that people have the most difficulty for, by dealing with and are often treated poorly. You have the industries that are mature, where the technology is changing, where the market is changing. It's usually both. And sometimes they have lots of employment. They were highly specialized in your region, but now things are changing. That could be everything from agriculture to food, from food processing, processing to some aspect of the energy. So the question is, with transforming clusters, what can you do to help them cope with exogenous changes like technology and markets? locally so we preserve as much value. We've worked in former socialist countries where they were shutting these businesses down and you spin off the parts of the cluster, the transforming cluster that are valuable and you save those. They may, they may be an automotive cluster that has expertise in material science or in data processing or in engineering and you spin that off. And the idea is that you sometimes you take the pieces that were once inside automotive and they become the seeds of new clusters or sometimes you lean it out, you, know, you get it skinny, you get it down, and you focus on what you're really good at, and you keep on rolling. So that's transforming clusters. The seeds are the ones that people understand, but they often don't know how to manage. Why are seeds important? We find there are regions that have assets that they don't use. They don't even know they are. I was talking with some people here yesterday about in agriculture. We've had cases where we've shown people they could produce all these different crops. We've done this in Canada, we've done this in Brazil. 
We have all these crops they produce, and they're producing commodities, and they're shipping them to international <coughs> markets. And they were saying, okay, how is your pricing? How's your, how's your, oh, it's pretty good, but we've had some bad times. And you said, have you ever thought of what you can extract out of the agricultural product that has value? Have you ever gone deeper into the technologies that actually transform the actual product into something else? And we've had clients where we went through 24 crops. We looked at each crop in terms of hundreds, hundreds of different ingredients that can be extracted from a given crop. And I'm talking from, from, from canola to tomato paste. And we've shown people that if you stop thinking of yourself as an agricultural producer, but as an ingredient producer, you can do both agriculture and ingredients and make a lot more money. And it's not thinking about seeds, and I mean literally, seeds and seeds. You have assets that you sometimes don't understand. It might be minerals that you haven't found. It might be tourist assets that you haven't harnessed. It might be universities that produce a lot of research, but are very bad at actually spitting off and commercializing. Boy, I deal with that all the time. My favorite topic, by the way, dealing with how to take assets out of places like universities and transform them into new sources of value. The point is, any region, any region has many assets that are not tapped, and they can take many forms. But you have to plant those seeds, you have to grow them, and you have to help them move over to the emergency state. I'm sorry to ramble on so much. So I've now talked to you about two of the four principles. If you're going to be economist, we need a little micro -economics. First, think regionally. Second, focus on building your cluster portfolio. But how do you do that is the third question. And the only way to do that is to create advantages and inputs. If you do not do that, there will never be a cluster. If there is a cluster, it's because there are advantages. But those advantages can fail. They can fail because they're not aligned with the industry. And one of the sad problems that we found over the years in so many places we've worked is that communities or regions do not understand that they need to align every input with the clusters, not just the economy. I, I, when we do location studies, we get these brochures from every region on Earth. They say, we have the highest quality of life. We have a lovely place to live. And I said, yeah, so does everyone else. I mean, the question is, what differentiates you? And when we locate, when we do work on a, you know, we help get investment-ready communities, we're talking to people about how to align their inputs with specific clusters. Now, I'm going to talk about eight types of inputs, very briefly, because it takes a lot of time to go over. But each one of these has many metrics that you can apply and many ways to turn them into really tremendous assets. Innovation, moving knowledge to fun. I was saying that like we work at universities. Universities are great at discovery, but they're not really good at development or deployment. Some are better than others. The land grant universities in the US are are actually doing pretty well. Some private universities are excelling, but they're not always. They, because they have a conflict between the traditional education and research role and that role of economic development. So there are ways to look at that. A high performing economy has an innovation pipeline that does discovery of innovation, either its own or it brings it in from somewhere else. It does development, it turns that innovation into an actual solution to a problem, and then it has a way to deploy it as a product or service. It goes discover, develop, deploy. The point is, very few regions get that. They think, oh, our university is world class, it's a great university. Guess what? It's exporting its knowledge to my clients in other countries. Because it does great publishing, great has great faculty, and they don't do anything with its knowledge to harness it in their region. And believe me, that's a big part of our work, It's trying to harness regional Capacity in institutions, universities, laboratories, hospitals that don't even realize, don't, they don't know what assets they have. So that's one. Workforce. Well, that one is, you can probably understand that better than you know, everyone, which is you have to pay through 12, you have to prepare people. You want people who have this STEM expertise, science, technology, engineering, um, mathematics. You want to have community colleges that are not just teaching traditional curriculum for occupations but actually are studying how to deliver what each university, uh, each cluster needs. Uh, we've had some great experiences here in Canada, in many regions where we work, where we've actually found that the community colleges have decided who's a specialist in certain training for certain clusters, and sometimes they all do the same. It doesn't matter. The question is, are you understanding your cluster portfolio as a education system? <coughs> universities, we've had cases where universities do not understand the clusters that are around them because they think nationally or globally, and they've worked it out. We've got them to understand clusters and create new degree programs and curriculum and actually become closely along. Um, finance. Capital markets often underserve 
the local economy because they're basically lending money to wherever, wherever, wherever the best deal flow is. But we found ways to actually help create new seed funds, new ways to invest in companies as, as they grow, and ways to restore the finance structure that don't create new financial institutions, but use existing resources in new ways. Because the problem with markets, this is some of the grandfather here, the problem with markets is, the problem with markets is deal flow. Capital markets want to give money and make money, but they can't do it to you or in your region unless your flow of deals is high quality, different than other ones, and winning. So what we found in this economic strategy or economic therapy work, the key thing we do is within clusters is we help create a deal flow of early stage companies or growing companies or transforming companies that through the collaborative process we make them better ready. We reduce, reduce the risk and increase the excitement. But we also pull in all the financial people. We've done it here in actually in, in, in Alberta in the film industry many years ago. We actually brought producers of all sorts of different media companies together with investors who never thought about investing in that area. And we created a collaboration around how, how to make financing for media more easy. The point is, I just I'm trying to be a coach here. It's not about money. There's tons of money out there. It has to be in cattle or in, or in real estate or in oil and gas in certain cases. But the point is, if you can create deal flow that's a qualified deal in volume, people can choose. And you're waste management. So logistics, delivering the goods. You have to be able to get to and from your markets, whether it's virtual, these days electronic, you know, on the internet, high bandwidth, or whether it's by uh, uh, regular uh, road or highway, those are just realities. But the point is, we've had cases actually, uh, Metro was Calgary or anything, where we sat down, we got a, a free highway offer on change for it to meet cluster needs. Both sides haven't been talking to each other, it was amazing. And they said, oh, let's do that. That's how economies work. Market supply and then learning why and talking all the time. So that was the first four. Now we get into resources. The world is changing because of global climate change into things like um, how do we get not just affordable energy, but sustainable energy? How do we share the, you know, the co generation? How do we use? There's so much money that can be made in a constructive way in any region just by thinking about those things collaboratively that it's, it's bogged my mind that people are not doing more. There are ways to, to extract and use and generate and share energy that is greener, that is more cost effective. Uh, I won't go into details, but let me just say that in waste, I, mean, I never thought I'd say this, but I love waste. Because I want to use it to create jobs and make money. Waste management is a field of innovation where if you can create, you can create so many ways of converting uh, municipal waste, uh, agricultural waste, uh, medical waste into value added if you do a collaborative process to do that. So what, I, what I'm suggesting here is that a high performing region will have advantages and inputs in its resources, whether it's energy, water, and waste conversion. They also have, this is a tough one for a lot of smaller communities, marketing infrastructure. They'll have the ability to connect to customers in very different ways. Because in hot regions, and I you know whether it's Silicon Valley for biotech or software or transportation or, or other places, it doesn't matter. There's something that is important that is grown and developing, which is the ability to productize, to conceive of a product. I was saying before about ag, shipping from commodities to ingredients, or there's different ways of thinking. So you need people who can help you think that. You also need to find pathways to markets. Uh, provinces and federal governments try to create trade assistance programs for exports, that's great. But there are ways to find people who understand it have stories and have connections. It is not about government doing it for you necessarily. It's about you and the marketplace getting together and saying, oh, how can we do that? Uh, so <coughs> governance, is, yeah, I'm going to breeze through the last two here. Governance is one which is always, business always has a lot to grieve about. But what we found over the years is that there's ways to actually talk about governance that changes the tone and the outcomes so dramatically, it's amazing. For example, typical, I mean, I'm sure you've all been there. You sit in a meeting with a bunch of businesses and you say, you know, taxes are too high. Or they'll say, regulation is too high. And what we found, and I'm, I'm really sincere when I say this, we found a concept that's so simple is this. You do not talk about taxes being high or low, you talk about return on taxation. I've used that idea and a lot of people don't, they don't quite get it. The point is, 
what am I getting here in this region for the tax I pay compared to somewhere else? And what we find is when we show that, companies, I, we've actually modeled this, companies do not care about whether taxes are high or not, they care about input advantage. And if you look at the economies in the US anyway, that are growing fastest, they have higher tax levels. Why? Because they're building roads, they're building schools, they're, they're taking care of themselves. And this negative uh, perspective about investment and taxes, it, it, it's a mis misconstrual of what it takes. You feed your kids so they can grow, you know, that's all that stuff. So what we found in governments is that if you use a return on taxation logic, you can tell a story that's very favorable. That's one. In terms of regulations, what businesses want are not necessarily deregulation. They want regulations that are efficiently executed. The bureaucracy doesn't drive them crazy. They want to comply. If other people have to comply, it's a level playing field, more or less. It's not always true. That's exactly. But you can streamline sometimes if it isn't a level. This is all level playing field. There are ways to make these things collaborate. Finally, quality of life. You have to care for everybody. You know, to have a civilization. And so what we look at is whether or not a region is able to provide affordable housing, whether it's home ownership or apartments at a price that's a competitive benchmark or relative, uh, relatively uh, competitive level. We look at healthcare. Of course, in Canada, you have national healthcare, but we look at the incidence of disease and whether there's a higher preponderance of certain like childhood asthma or diabetes or overweight or heart disease relative to other regions, which means your heart, your health system is either doing its job or, your, or someone is. So healthcare is important, and, and recreation and culture. Places that have hot recreation and culture for certain clusters are the, one of the major factors for the location decision. So the lesson here is you have to look at the inputs in your economy to grow. You have to look at the capacity of your schools, your research institutions, your banks. Are they you have capacity to respond? Not, not competency. That's another question. Do they have the competency to, to, to deliver? Do they have skills that you need? And do they have responsiveness? Are they open to change? I would almost say that this responsiveness is the most crucial variable because in any entrepreneurial world, it's this learning and changing factor that makes things happen. And I know it sounds mundane, but if people are open to learning and changing, that's what makes markets happen. Markets are not about monetization. Markets are about negotiating an agreement where your values and their values come together. So I think that the key point about this third, the third point, that input advantage, excuse me, commercial right? The point is, if you read, doing cluster committees, cluster working groups, that's fine, but that's not what economic development is about. It's about aligning clusters with their input institutions and making sure that both sides have capacity, competency, and responses to work together. So now, how do you make this happen? Well, in a high-performing economy, it goes on naturally. That's something to keep in mind. It should be a natural feature of any economy. It should not have to be a public program or, or something that's mandated. It should be natural. Well, yeah, but it isn't. It isn't in a lot of places, for whatever reason. But the high-performing economies we work in today wherever they are on the planet, they suddenly realize it's the economy, stupid. It's not government or, or, or not necessarily the private sector. It's everybody. Everybody is the economy. So what's important is understanding that markets, at their core, if you believe in the principles that markets are worthwhile, which some people, I suppose, do not, but the truth is markets are about a natural process of identifying and matching values to value. So the thing we forget is that collaboration goes on every day, and if it isn't going on, we can help it. It's either business to business, business to institution, institution to institution, market intermediary and user. And I'm gonna start by saying businesses understand collaboration, but they also have lots of jealousies, anxieties, they sabotage each other. In India, when we were working in Bangalore, they were basically literally, literally sabotaging each other. And we said, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe you want to collaborate locally to compete global. They said, oh, are you sure? <laughs> they did. They said, yes. No, they, they, it was, they were brilliant. They are, and of course, this is the boom. They just, just blossomed. The point is, businesses understand the nature of collaboration, but sometimes they, they think only business to business. Getting businesses to work with institutions is usually case by case. It's not bad. 
but they need to get used to it. They have to understand the principles, but it needs to be fostered. Institution, institution, boy, that's that's the hardest thing I think of, of all four things here. Because a lot of institutions say, well, I'm you know our university, our our Costco Lawrence, we're competing against those guys, and they're not used to the fact that by collaborating locally, they can grow, they can get more clients, they can get more revenue. I can tell you many different stories. So there are ways to make the economy different, but you have to do these business, business, business institution, institutional institution. <coughs> Uh, initiative, but what comes out a lot in these cluster initiatives on a regional level are new intermediaries, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. But the point is that sometimes there's not a market-making vehicle. Now, in America, we have you know the, the farm co-ops, the uh, uh, what's the word that we use? Uh, the you know, the store, these used chain stores. You guys have your own term. The point is the Markets have always found intermediaries when individual companies don't have the solution. They need something to share in infrastructure. There's tons of them now financially on the internet, different ways to create <laughs> supply of networks. But the reality is you can create new types of power utilities that are community focused or regional focused or tech park focused. There are new ways to do training partnerships. The point is intermediaries that aggregate demand. Remember I was talking about creating deal flow for finance? Same thing. You create, you create the flow of multiple deals, you screen them and rate them, and you create a, a group of buyers and put them together. Market intermediation is at the heart of what this economic strategy is about. So that's what we want to do is help markets work. We want to convene the marketplace. It's a term we use a lot, but it's so important. It's not about committees, it's not about task forces, it's about really bringing the marketplace together in a room like this one. It's about engaging stakeholders. It's not about having someone recommend to someone who tell, recommends to someone else. It's about getting the stakeholders to say, yeah, I have a problem that I'm willing to work on with you if you, you know, use your resources to work with me. That's what markets are about. And it's creating this notion, which is in a high-performing economy, there are these things called communities of exchange. They're not magical, but they're new relationships, new ways to exchange something that people hadn't done before. So the outcome, if you learn to do this, is what we call a vital cycle, not a vicious circle. But boy, I see a lot of vicious circles. And when I was working in, in Eastern Europe a lot, we used, to, we used to sort of say, oh my god, oh my god. But the reality is, I say, give me a pathological bureaucracy, give me an arthritic institution to work with in the absence of no infrastructure, no market, no industry. Because sometimes in developing countries, there is no there there to work with at all. So I'd rather tear apart a former you know, Eastern European structure that's not working right and find ways to save and apply its assets, like we talked about with the transforming cluster. But the goal here is more is less dramatic. It is how we create this interactivity between a, a portfolio of clusters and a set of economic input providers. That is the goal. A diverse, adaptive, and regional company. That's what we can do. And it's not a bureaucratic, bureaucratic activity, it is a natural and really quite good thing. Now, how am I on time here? I just want to check before I, because uh, I have about 10 more minutes. What? Okay, that's good. I can talk all day about this. I do. <laughs> yeah, it's a billion. I really care about this. And we've done this in Bosnia, we've done this in Brazil. It's, when people chime in, you've had these fabulous events where people had a, it was like, you know, uh, an epiphany. They didn't realize they didn't have to follow these bureaucratic or ugly corporate policies, but they could actually use their resources in ways. I'm now going to talk about how they did it, because we've been doing this a lot of different places. It's not our, it's not a proprietary concept as much as it is a way of doing things that makes sense. Five steps. You make them rhyme. How's that? So you can remember. Mobilize. Analyze. Catalyze. Realize. Actualize. For me, my memory is very poor. So, that's, okay. so first thing is, a lot of people do economic. They, someone announces an economic strategy and they're going to go forward and do it. That's not the way we do it. What we do is it's like almost a movement. We get the sponsors who are always representing the economy together. We create a stewardship group. We get the region ready to collaborate. We talk about people with people. We say, are you ready to do this? Do you want to do this? We did it in Edmonton. We did it here in Calgary. Uh, there in Calgary. This is our the point is, the process of getting people ready, where right, they understand that they are the customer, they are the focus, it's about their well-being, opens up a very exciting process. 
So we, but we always start by creating a leadership group and a collaborative network that helps track things so that when we move forward, everyone is ready. And the key is this notion of stewards. I said this earlier in the presentation when we talked about regions. The idea about making an economy different is about being a stewardship group. You know, it's the Scottish term steward means servant leader. And it's a term that is so important. You have to be committed to the end goal of change, not just your particular interest. So that's key. You want to really recruit people very carefully. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today. The second step, once you've mobilized everybody, is to analyze, to do a diagnostic baseline of how your economy is doing. You have to have a reference point. You have to know how are we doing next to someone else, someone next, whether it's in Alberta or in, in, in Canada or in the United States or North America or the world. Comparative analysis is really important because it talks to you about proportions, like right? how are we doing, uh, how bad are we doing, or how good are we doing. Sometimes the stories are really exciting. There are three analytic focal points that are really important, and they reflect the framework that I was talking about. The first thing is you want to analyze how have we been performing for the last 10 years compared to other places. We look at uh, you know, prosperity, disparity, sustainability, blah, blah, blah. So we benchmark that. So we, we know what we wake up with in the morning. We know how good or bad we are. So that's, that, that's analyzed and analyzed past one. Number two is what are, what's driving our economy? What is our cluster portfolio? You identify all your clusters, you look at the stage of life cycle, you look at their performance on growing, shrinking, leaving, there's all sorts of stuff you can assess. And it's very helpful to bring to the table data. The third thing is you look at your economic inputs. How good are we doing? How bad are we doing? And on schools and K-12 and community colleges and college universities and workforce training, how good are we doing in innovation, in discovery, in development, plenty look at all of those. And you say, oh, we have a lot of assets, but we're not doing so well. Or we have a lot of assets, and they're doing terrific. And that's fine to say. Then you present the, this, the, uh, the performance outcomes, the economic drivers, and the economic inputs in a great form. And you say, here's our region. Here's how we are. And you have the stewards talk about it. You have people say, we never thought about this. We didn't realize this. And everybody has a company meeting. You know, what a company is. It a company something? Anyway, has an epiphany that, oh, you know, we better work on this. So that's the goal. That's that's step that's a step. And I'm not going to dwell on this because I, I want to wrap up. But the point is, I think there's a really creative way of looking at your region. Many communities bound together not by politics, but by economic common commonalities. It's the idea of thinking of a regional holding company. It's not it's owned by its citizens. The industry is part of that. So that's the important point. I'm really, so so we, we've mobilized you, you've got yourself uh, analyzed, so we have a diagnostic baseline to use to understand where we're going. So what do you do? And this is the heart of your futures right here, step three, catalyze. It's completing the cluster strategies. And since I don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna just cut to the chase. You actually bring together each cluster with many of the companies, the suppliers, but also all those economic input institutions in one room, cluster by cluster. So this room has that cluster, that room has that. They meet three times at least for three hours. This is our way of looking at it in different rooms. But the point is, the first time the clusters meet, they talk about the challenges that they're willing to work on. They cannot complain. If someone says, you know, they ought to do that, they say, sorry, shut up. Uh, not why, but so that. The point is, what we, we, we point at, you cannot complain if you're not going to take some ownership, right? So we get the clusters for the first time to say, here's a problem that my company is willing to work on with their other companies and the schools or the banks or these people. And suddenly, we have a commonality. So step one is, what are the challenges that we share in common? It's very exciting, but we do something else. After each cluster does that, we bring the representatives or the co-chairs of each cluster together with the stewards of the region. And we have another quasi epiphany, which is, wow, this cluster has problems that are similar to that cluster and that cluster. So now what we're doing is something very profound. We're building from the bottom up a set of regional cross-cutting directions, which I call we call flagships. But what's so great about it is that since the clusters care about the issue individually, as in, you know, this cluster and that cluster, but they're now coming together, they create a supporting, a very strong business and institutional support for a regional wide initiative. The, the second time they meet, we provide examples of solutions that they can choose from or play with. Usually they say, ah, no, no, we're going to do it our way. 
and they come up with actions they're going to work on collaboratively. Not that someone else should do. But each cluster says, you know, we have a problem here with workforce in this. We need more C software engineers or something. We're going to work with the community college and school to do this. And the school said, yeah, we'll do it because they're going to, businesses are going to help us do that. It could be banking, finance, innovation, infrastructure, logistics, school, and all this stuff. So, what now they do, they come up with memorandum of the draft of a memorandum of understanding between each other about what actions they're willing to take. So that's the second time. And they meet again with the stewards and they aggregate that upwards. And now they say, oh, that's interesting. Your cluster is looking at a similar issue to ours and you're looking at it in a different way. Maybe we can combine both ways or maybe we can use the same way. And that's a great kind of convergence. The third, the third step is the bringing, bringing it all to closure. So now we have each cluster has challenges they're agreeing to work on to be more competitive and grow, whatever the state life cycle. They've agreed on actions they're willing to work on collaboratively, which is very much the heart of this. But now they have to do the hard part, which is a business plan, a very short business plan, where they make commitments, and that is really a formal MOU. So each cluster has a set of actions, a set of that they're going to work on with memorandum agreements, or understand who's going to do what. And if they don't have the right person, it's their problem. They have to get someone into the group to do that. If they do, they do that, they, they, it's like, it reminds me of venture capital forms where they have to pitch their own peers this, this approach, so they actually have a dialogue. And they wrap it up, having a, a confirmation of what they're willing to do together. And then they say, we well, the facility always, they say, now what's the return on solution if we do this as a cluster? What is our output? How will our cluster change a year from now, six, six months from now, a year from now, two years, three years, five years? And they do their own scenario of the future of the cluster, and it kind of heartens them and develops the world. So that, that is going on. The point of all this is to be in the marketplace. I think that's a simple lesson. If you don't do it, you're losing, you're going to lose, you're going to just do programs for the rest of your lives. And the goal, this may look like a complicated matrix, but it's actually not. It's about every cluster had to have problems in any one of those categories that we've been talking about over here. And there may be solutions that focus on industry formation, or enterprise formation, <coughs> or expansion, or the traffic. And I'm not going to go into, I don't have time to go into examples here. But uh, one thing is important is that at the regional level, which is sometimes a breath of fresh air, aggregating up from the clusters to the regional level leads to these flagships I was describing, which are solutions to shared problems. Some of the flagship initiatives are legacy initiatives where they're solving a problem that's been around for a long time. They clean up something that's been just for everybody. And sometimes they do something that's catalytic. We've seen new universities created, new technology uh, uh, institutes, new venture funds created because of this alignment across the clusters to the region. So we build off of the clusters. Each cluster has their solutions. We also have regional wide that are raising uh, regional initiatives that will be rising tide problems. Uh, the last step is to build a partnership, and this is where we, I was talking this morning at length about where most of these initiatives have a trouble. You've got to create a matrix of the input providers and the output providers to work together, keep them rolling, and there's a new type of partnership that's needed that's not just a committee or a program as I described before. There needs to be something that keeps clusters coming back, not just as companies, but as input providers, and that's really the key thing. I think if I can leave you with any, any message that there needs to be a new generation of partnerships in every region that can be in the market for shared goals. And that's the simple message. Focus on clusters on one side, focus on input institutions on the other side, understand each other, adapt, and change. That's really the key. Uh, I'm not going to talk about implementation because it takes too much more time. But the premise, this is what you want to have as an outcome. You want to have a partnership that is not about programs. You can have programs, that's not a problem. The point is, it's always going to be about listening to the clusters, listening to the input providers, having them learn how to work. You have delegates from the clusters, you have input teams from the input institutions. They learn to be customer-centric both ways. That's the key point. It's a big claim to fame when regions can say our community colleagues know these different industries very well, when our banks understand these different industries very well. This is the key point. The goal is a partnership for the century, hopefully before the century is over, we'll be doing well. So that's it. I'm sorry to go on so long. Thank you very much.